We're going to land on the moon and we're going to return safely from the moon by the end of the decade of 1960, by the end of 1969. Well, there's a young fighter pilot and uh, over there, I said, yeah, sure, you know, who am I? We're going to do that. <laughs> you know, there's some of people older, old enough in this audience to remember. Uh, rocketry back in those days was five, four, three, two, one, blow up, rather than lift up, mostly. So it was very rare that we had a successful mission. And, he, and we got 15 minutes in space, and he's committed us to go to the moon and return safely. The astronauts like that part. <laughs> uh, nobody wanted to go on a one-way trip to the moon. Now today, we got some astronauts who want to do a one-way trip to Mars. And uh, uh, I, I didn't volunteer for that trip, but I did volunteer to go back to the moon. But at my age, NASA says, don't call us, we'll call you. If we ever need me, we need you. And I don't think I'm gonna have a chance to uh, go back into the moon again. So anyway, uh, after in 19, uh, in my mind, now looking back on all of that, the most amazing thing about it was eight years and two months after Kennedy announced the program, I'm sitting in mission control, talking to Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin when they landed on the moon. Eight years and two months we did that program. <laughs> It was a miracle, I think. But we had a lot of help. It was a team effort. 400,000 people working on that program over, over from 61 until 70, uh, end of 72, when the last Apollo went to the moon. So I go back to MIT as a graduate student in 1962, and uh, I'm in the Aero Astro Department getting a master's degree. And it turns out that MIT has the contract to build the Apollo guidance and navigation system. So I said, well, that might be an interesting thing to do a thesis on, help with this system. And so I was selected by my thesis advisor and, and the people at uh, Instrumentation Lab, back then NASA Draper Lab, uh, and so, Myself and another Apollo, uh, another uh, Air Force uh, pilot was, were working on the Apollo guidance and navigation system. And as a result of that, I met some of the previous astronauts from the third group, like Charlie Baskett and uh, Don Isley and uh, several others. And I'd never known people so enthusiastic about our job than these guys. And I said, how do I get that job? And he said, well, get this degree and then you go to test pilot school. And I think if you, when you go to test pilot school, then you might have a chance of getting selected. So I apologized, I applied for test pilot school and got selected when I was, uh, after I graduated, got my degree. And I was there in 1964. 1965, I graduated and stayed on staff at the, uh, test pilot school at Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, the month, the next month, I'm sitting in there watching some pro football game on a Sunday afternoon, reading the Los Angeles Times uh, off and on, and I read an article, NASA's selecting more astronauts, please apply. So I answered a front page want ad <laughs> in the LA Times. <laughs> And there were 3,500 of us that applied, all men back in those days, and uh, they selected 19 of us, and of which I was one. It was so thankful. So we moved to Houston. Just recently, as, a, as an aside, just recently, NASA selected another group of astronauts. There were 12 that were selected, and they had 18,000 applications. So you can imagine the competition today to get into the ESMA program. Fortunately, I only had to compete against guys and 3,500 others. And so I was selected and went to work at NASA. And uh, two chances of going to the moon in my group was slim and none. We were the junior guys. 
the rookies, the gophers, you know, that was our job, uh, monitoring systems development and stuff. But unfortunately, during those days, we had uh, eight astronauts killed in various accidents. Three killed in a fire at Kennedy Space Center, uh, <clears throat> four killed in airplane accidents, one killed automobile accident. We had several that were grounded for medical reasons. Uh, we had senior ones like John Glenn, Scott Carpenter and others, they retired and went off uh, for other uh, activities in their careers. And so we sort of bubbled up into this mix of astronauts and maybe we would get a chance to fly. And sure enough, uh, several of us did get a chance to fly on Apollo. I started my career really as a Apollo 10 support and was in mission control, talking to uh, them and they were in lunar orbit. So our whole team moved over on Apollo 11, so the first landing on the moon with Neil Armstrong and uh, Buzz Aldrin, I was in mission control uh, talking to them as they went down. I was what's called CAPCOM, Capsule Communicator. And the, as they started down, the tension began to rise in mission control because things weren't going too well. We had a problem with uh, communications. Uh, our antennas weren't working right, so they were uh, uh, communication data drop out. We got that fixed, and then the computer was overloaded. And uh, so it was given all these flashing all these alarms. But, but we were so well trained that we kept overcoming all of these problems and kept going on the descent, uh, even with that. Then we, at 7,000 feet above the moon, Neil sees it surface for the very first time and uh, he can't land there. We had him targeted into the wrong place. So he had to level off and fly over this boulder field. And that takes a lot of extra fuel. So now we're minimum fuel as he starts down. And uh, I called Eagle, their call sign was Eagle. I said, Eagle, 60 seconds. He had 60 more seconds to land before he would hear an abort from mission control. Then I called Eagle 30 seconds. And I mean, you could, the tension was so thick in mission control, dead silence, except for that one transmission. And, uh, and it still went on the ground. 13 seconds later, Buzz Aldrin, I heard him say, contact, engine stop. Well, we knew they were on the ground because when you stop the engine, you're gonna land. <laughs> it was some matter. <laughs> Hopefully they were right side up. And, uh, about uh, three or four seconds later, this coolest pilot I ever met was Neil Armstrong. And he said, Houston Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. And so uh, I, I was so excited, I couldn't even say Tranquility. It came out, Roger, twang, I mean, twang, <laughs> uh, we copy you on the ground, we got a bunch of guys that about to turn blue and we're breathing again. And it was a big sigh of relief, and then it was flat. Had they gone to zero, and I called the board, I'm sure what I would have heard from the, mission, from the spacecraft was, say again, Houston, we didn't read you right. <laughs> they were going to land that vehicle, whatever happened in mission control. Because he was, you know, 100 feet off the moon. And uh, they had some fuel that was to abort fuel, so they were gonna land anyway. We didn't have to do that. Nobody had to disobey the mission rules. And so we had a successful landing. Four landings later, it was my turn on Apollo 16, fifth landing uh, on the moon. We had a bigger lunar module, not size-wise, but more consumables like oxygen and water and fuel and things like that. They had a, we had a car, so our stay was not going to be 23 hours, it was going to be three days. And so uh, we landed in a place called Bay Park. As you view the moon from the Earth, we were right in the, almost in the middle of the full moon. Uh, and uh, it was the mountains of the moon. Uh, had we landed uh, in, uh, let's say, Apollo 11 would land at sea level, uh, which was like the coast of the U.S. sea level, we would have landed on the top of the Rocky Mountains. 
So it was a, a big change in elevation and a big, uh, of a, a, a big change in scenery. Uh, they landed in the Mars, which was uh, volcanic, fairly flat. We landed in this big valley with mountains uh, all around except to the, to the uh, west of us. John Young was my commander, uh, and he was a veteran astronaut. This was his uh, fourth flight, uh, and uh, he ended up having six missions, uh, uh, two, uh, two on Gemini, two on Apollo, and two on the space shuttle. And so he and I were on the moon together, and I was the lunar module pilot, he was the commander, so he was actually flying the machine, and I was talking him down uh, onto the surface. Uh, he picked out a great spot uh, to land. Our problem was when our, we, we had photographs of our landing spot, and the photographs uh, were uh, based on uh, from orbit on Apollo 14, and they had 45 feet resolution. So objects let us less than 45 feet we couldn't see. So at 7,000 feet, we pitch over and we look out. And there are a lot of holes on the moon less than 45 feet. <laughs> a 30 footer would swallow the lunar module. And so uh, we had to maneuver around and, and get a, a landing spot which John uh, selected. And I was so excited. We were six hours behind schedule. And I was so excited when we touched down. It was kind of strange. Uh, oh, uh, our call time was Orion. I said, oh, Orion is finally here. He's been fantastic. I hollered. And uh, we were just jumping up and down uh, in our river module. We were supposed to get outside and do our first excursion right after landing, power down, put on your backpack, get outside. But during, during the six hour delay uh, to landing, Mission Control changed the rules or changed the flight plan so that we had to go. <laughs> <laughs> Still dust. 
but you never sank in more than just a couple of inches. Had really good bearing strength as we walked across the surface, as we drove our car uh, across the surface. And the car really revolutionized lunar exploration because prior to the car, you could go you know, half a kilometer or half a mile, and that was it. Now, you could drive as far as you wanted to go, but if it broke down, you had to walk back. Uh, so uh, the idea was to go about maybe five miles, and that was our maximum radius for our, for our landing. We felt right at home on the moon. There was no sense of danger. It was a very hostile environment. You had great confidence in your spacesuit. And it's your little office, if you will. It keeps you alive. You had a backpack on. It had all the oxygen regulators and stuff like that, the communications. And we had, it was never lonely. We, we were always in contact with one another or with, and with mission control. So you never felt alone. And as you, as you drove across, you'd see these different features that you would explore. And you were very busy uh, up there doing these experiments and things. Everybody says, uh, not everybody, but I get questions like, uh, what is it, what does the Earth look like when you look down at the Earth from the moon? Well, I said, when you're standing on the moon, you look down, you're looking at your feet. <laughs> It looks like we are here, and uh, the moon is 2,000 miles across. I said, you got to look up <laughs> to see the earth. Unfortunately, where we stood, the earth was right overhead. And in an Apollo spacesuit, you look up, and you're looking at the top of your helmet. So I didn't see the moon, I mean the earth from the moon. But in orbit, I had this beautiful view of the earth's rise, and it's blue and white and, and uh, brown earth just hung in the blackness of space. On the way to the moon, it's always daylight, so there's no, no stars out. The sun's always shining, and like down here when the sun shines, you don't see the stars, uh, same in space, except it's black because there's no atmosphere out there, of course. Now, Mars has an atmosphere, and Jupiter and those other planets, but the moon has a moon. So you're standing there on the moon and you just look up to this jet black sky you feel like you can reach up and touch it. Well, I want to show a video for you and then we'll have some questions after uh, uh, I uh, narrate this video. So uh, somewhere somebody's got the controls, there you are, and he's going to start this. It's silent, it's 15 minutes, it's from uh, liftoff to splashdown. Our landing, our uh, vehicle is a Saturn V vehicle. It's the biggest rocket ever launched up to this day. It was 33 feet. Uh, oh, oh, we go. Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> oh here, okay, here we go. Uh, <clears throat> every flight had a patch. Uh, that was our patch. This is uh, Moonwalker, it's a, it's a little DVD I put together. And this is the launch pad, pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center, now used by SpaceX, by the way. But this was all Apollo launches from this pad. And as we lifted off, the engines were pushing with seven and a half million pounds of thrust. The white stuff you see falling off was ice. Uh, we had about two tons of ice on the side of the vehicle due to the cold fuel, and it's about Within just the first couple of seconds, all the ice was shook off. And the big emotion at this point, a feeling at this point, was the vibration. Didn't have much noise, but the vibration in the spacecraft was like this from side to side. We're at the very top, and the engines are moving to control your trajectory. So that's 360 feet of aluminum structure. And as the engines move, that vibration goes up to the spacecraft and he'll whip it you back and forth like crazy. And it, the frequency stays the same the whole first stage, which was two minutes and 41 seconds for us. And so we're vibrating uh, in this spacecraft. I got a little nervous. Uh, I didn't remember everybody telling me it was supposed to vibrate so hard. And, uh, and the windows are covered over so you can't see out. And so my heart was really pounding. And uh, when I got home, I asked the flight surgeon, I said, what was my heartbeat at liftoff? He said, you were really excited. It was 144 per minute. <laughs> and that's really fast. And I said, yeah. 
I said, what was John Young's? 70. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a cool one his whole flight. He'd, been, he'd read one of these before. So then the first day shuts down, we were accelerating at four and a half times gravity, and you go from four and a half to zero just like that. First stage drops off, big train wreck, and then, the, and then you see it falling away. And during this first stage, two minutes and 41 seconds, we burned up four and a half million pounds of fuel. Uh, and uh, then the interstage falls away, and the five engines on the second stage light off, and you can see the white clouds above the Atlantic. The first stage is that white thing, and uh, Florida's over on the horizon over there. And we're on our way. Uh, the second stage gets us almost in orbit. Over Australia, we left orbit at 25,000 miles an hour. And this is a picture I took of the United States. If that's California at the bottom, on the right is Baja. Mexico's up here, the Rocky Mountains with the dark brown things. And then it's the southwestern United States with the Arctic Circle over on the left. And uh, Mexico and Central America sort of bends around. The Apollo had 300 cubic feet of volume, uh, but with the instruments and everything else, each astronaut had about 68 cubic feet. This is T.K. Mattingly. He's going to stay in shape. He was our big jock. And uh, uh, John Young was the commander. Here I am. We're floating around in our long underwear. And it just sort of shows you what things, how confusing things can get in a small spacecraft if you let things get away from you because they're going to all float off somewhere. Uh, interesting story, I hope I can tell you later about Mattingly losing his ring uh, in the spacecraft. The food was all dehydrated uh, and you had to add water. This is, not, this is a space shuttle flight, but that's grape juice. So the, all the molecular forces equalized and got this ball of grape juice uh, and Pinky Nelson, in it goes, and then the flying banana trick. Uh, <laughs> we had great juice, but we didn't have any bananas on Apollo. That was, uh, like I said, spatial. Uh, it took th Apollo trajectory took three days, uh, 72 hours to get to the moon. We orbited the moon for a day, and then John Young and I now in this spacecraft with Mattingly taking our picture. Uh, we're looking out of these two windows, uh, and right above the white uh, circle is a hatch. And that hatch is about 30 inches in the diameter. So you got on the moon, you got on your hands and knees, and you crawled out backwards onto the porch, uh, which was right here, and then up the lat down the ladder, of course, onto the moon. And from the porch to the ladder, it's almost 15 feet to give you some sense of scale of the lunar module. So we pitched over, at, uh, at, on, well first we had a delay, he had a real problem in the spacecraft, so we had to rendezvous, you see him on the left, the Earth, and then uh, this uh, gray of the moon. But they gave us a go for landing, we pitched over and we recognized these two large black craters, those are 500 yards in diameter by the way, and now we're about 40, 50 feet off the moon, you'll start seeing the dust Rocket engine blast blowing the dust away. The shadow comes in right below the landing pads. There were some electrical probes, and when they touched the moon, it turned on a light inside, said contact, and you shut the engine down and dropped in. Uh, for you Navy guys here, that was a carrier landing. <laughs> really solid, but uh, we were there safely. And uh, John really planted, uh, oh, I call him Old Percy, I call him Old Percy, planted another one. You see the contrast between the dark shadows and the gray of the moon. Uh, John has his first, uh, uh, first uh, few steps on the moon in the shadow. I get out about 10 minutes later and we start our uh, experiments. Uh, uh, we didn't have any digital cameras back then, so I, this is a film magazine I'm putting on the back of a Hasselblad camera. And that film magazine had dust on it, so I was, Blowing the dust off. <laughs> of course, that didn't work. That was just dumb. I was like, what are you trying to do, dummy? <laughs> anyway, uh, the camera had a trigger, and, and you just pulled the trigger and we took the picture. We had a TV camera that we put on the car, 
And uh, so I put the flag up, and that's me on the right. And uh, I, everybody had their picture taken uh, at the flag uh, on the last missions. And so John comes out to get his picture taken. And I said, John, give me a big salute. Give me a big Navy salute. So he, uh, he, gave, he got really enthusiastic. Big <laughs> <laughs> John, and, off he, and so we swapped places, and then I had my picture taken. Now this is my most embarrassing moment. I'm the guy disappearing on the right here, and as I, I'm jogging out and this, with this dumbbell, barbell thing, and on this side, the right side, is $10 million worth of moon experiments. And uh, so I'm jogging away, and they're doing well, and then they fall off. And since there's no atmosphere, the dust doesn't swirl. It just flies out in a parabola and lands uh, back on the, on the surface. Here I am drilling a hole on the moon. I had three of these, this little handheld battery drill, and they, they went into the moon 10 feet deep each. Uh, John was uh, doing a data station. Unfortunately, he got tangled up in one of our uh, electrical cables and pulled that loose, so we lost that experiment. This is the Grand Prix. This is uh, four minutes of, of the only time you see the lunar module underway, the whole car. And I'm standing there taking this picture. And what an amazing car. It was, uh, we set the, in Apollo 17, we set the moon speed record. This is a penetrometer experiment that we push in. And there I go. <laughs> and so, man, we gotta, man, we gotta get up. This is looking back to the uh, northeast, to the mountains on the northeast side of our landing spot. Called, we call it Smoky Mountains. Uh, now this is, uh, this is the scariest time, fearful time. I'm the guy on the left and I'm setting the moon high on <coughs> record. And off I go. But I'm <laughs> like that. And that backpack is not designed for that kind of fall. And so if I hit wrong, and the backpack break, I'm dead like that. So I knew I was in trouble, so I rolled right and broke my fall and bounced onto my back, and John came over, looked down, and said, you okay? And I said, I think so, John, help me up. So he helped me up, and my heart was pounding like this. And, and then I looked up, and the TV camera was pointed right at me, and Mission Control had seen this stupid stuff. <laughs> and, uh, that ended the Moon Olympics. Uh, I left a picture of my family up on the moon. Uh, after 45 years of cosmic radiation, it's all faded away. But uh, anyway, I took a picture of the picture. So we left the car up on the moon 
and they took a picture. <laughs> uh, an engineer in Mission Control is controlling this camera, by the way. And off we go. And uh, <clears throat> there were three cars on the moon. Uh, $8 million with dead batteries. If you want one, I can tell you where to go. Uh, <laughs> uh, still there. In fact, there's a picture of that car that the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has taken uh, as it orbits the moon. Uh, we join up with the command module in this picture. We jettison the lunar module in, in orbit, and we come home in the command ship. And on the way home, we, last thing that was really exciting, this is re-entry from scene on the inside. Big fireball outside. Seven and a half G deceleration. We didn't have any wings like space shuttle, but the center of gravity was all set, so you, it had lift, and so you could roll it back and forth to control your landing spot. So we'd roll inverted, then we'd roll up, then we'd roll right, roll left, and uh, to control our landing site, which is in the South Pacific. So it's like 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit outside, but inside, uh, the temperature went from about 66 to 76, uh, Fahrenheit during the time of re-entry. Uh, last 100,000 feet is basically falling straight down in a free fall. And at 23,000 feet above the surface, these small parachutes called the drogue chutes come out to make sure you're hanging in the right position. Not stable because you're wiggling, but hanging right. So the parachute's up. At 10,000 feet in Apollo, the main parachutes came open and you had this uh, beautiful sight because without those parachutes you were going to hit and kill yourself on impact. So uh, we were on track, you can see a helicopter uh, behind us over there, helicopter actually taking our picture and out of six and a half million pounds all that came back was 13,000 pounds of command module less than 213 pounds of moon rock. Uh, so it was a tremendous experience. Uh, I got one more outside chance to go. I was back up crew on the last mission, Apollo 17, uh, as backup lunar module pilot. Uh, but uh, the guy that flew was Jack Schmidt, and he wasn't going to let me close to him. Uh, so I didn't get a chance to break his leg, unfortunately. <laughs> I really wanted to go again. It was such an adventure. Well, that's. Uh, 45 years ago last April, we had one more flight on Apollo, Apollo 17, and then uh, Apollo was over. They canceled the last three missions, uh, and we went into space shuttle. It's over, now space station. And coming along, uh, that your generation is going to get to fly is uh, Orion, a NASA program on the biggest rocket ever launched called the SLS, when it ever launches. Year or two, and then uh, SpaceX has got uh, Falcon uh, uh, trying to get uh, human human rated. Uh, right now, it's unmanned. Uh, 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 let's see, the other one is uh, Boeing, and then another one is uh, Orbital ATK. So there's a lot going on in the space business, and. Uh, Fortunately, we're going to have our spacecraft so we can fly air astronauts to the space station uh, and on into deep space. Because Orion is a deep space vehicle and a, with enough modules on it and enough uh, protection for the, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, enough protection for uh, radiation, you could go to Mars and back in this spacecraft. So uh, I think we got a great future. Uh, there's a lot of interest in space. A lot of uh, young people like yourselves are studying math, science, technology, engineering, and there's a great need uh, in, in industry in our country for uh, those kind of skills. So uh, press on in your careers, and uh, good luck to each of you. Uh, uh, let me tell one more story, and then we'll have a chance maybe a couple questions. Uh, uh, I think we're probably supposed to finish in just a few minutes, but uh, maybe we can skip over a little bit. Well, anyway, I told you about Mattingly uh, losing his wedding ring. It, uh, it floated away in his spacecraft. He just took off his uh, watches and rings and stuff. But we didn't have any showers, so you just took a wet towel and rubbed down. And so he got dressed, except everything was there but his wedding ring, and it floated off into this spacecraft. 
This was the second day of the mission. And uh, he couldn't find it. So we landed on the moon on the fourth, fifth day, we landed on the moon. On the eighth day, we came back up. On the ninth day, we started home. Uh, or eighth day, we started home. And he's still looking for this ring. So on the way home, we had a space wall. Uh, he got, he op we opened the hatch. Uh, he and his spacesuit got out and went down to the back of the spacecraft to retrieve some film canisters. I floated out, locked my feet in the side of the hatch, and I'm just sitting there with his lifeline, making sure he's okay. I look over here, and there's the Earth 180,000 miles away, just a little thin sliver of blue and white. And I look, turn over this way, and back here, in this position, was this humongous moon, almost a full moon, about 50,000 miles away. And everywhere else you look, except for the sun, was just black. Well, I get back inside, and I'm now about six foot or seven foot from the door of the hatch, and I'm watching him. He's now come back, and he's shinnied up a, a 10 foot long pole working on a biology experiment. And I'm watching this uh, as we move through space, but you don't feel like you're moving, but we're actually moving towards Earth like 3,000 miles an hour. And I get this glint of gold, and I look over, and his wedding ring is gently tumbling out the hatch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and, I reach, and I, I'm wedged in, so I broke loose, and when I, threw, I grabbed for it, and I missed it, it there it was, gone, out, out in the space. And uh, it was a relative velocity, it was real slow. It, you know, a half a foot a second or something like that, maybe less. So it was just glistening and tumbling, and it was headed right towards him, and his back was to me, and it hit him on the back of the head, <laughs> which he didn't feel, and he was busy, and I couldn't, so I was lost in space. And when it hit that round helmet and that round ring, it took a 180 degree bounce and came straight back towards the hatch. <laughs> and about a minute or two later, it floated right back into the hatch, right in front of me, and I grabbed it. size of a medium-sized watermelon. 
which we didn't want to bring back, but Mission Control said bring it back. So. <laughs> <laughs> and when you were drilling through the moon, did you bring any coals or the rocks or these were all powders? No, we did. We brought actual rocks. Uh, probably more than half of our specimens were actual rocks that we pounded off with a hammer or we picked up loose on the surface and then the rest we shoveled up the powder, the, the regolith it's called, we picked up and, and put it in bags. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Claudia. I am a part of the uh, Naval ROTC program. Just wanted to say thank you very much for coming today and sharing your experiences and your stories. Um, I really would like to ask, uh, would you say your extensive and rigorous career uh, education played a vital role in your career, or were there outside factors that contributed to your great success? If so, what were they? Well, uh, of course, my education. Uh, without a good education, I, mean, I don't think I would have been selected uh, as an astronaut. Uh, and so I knew that I needed a good education. And I was going to stick with it to get the best education I could. And I did that at the Naval Academy. The Air Force encouraged me to go back to graduate school, so they sent me back. And with that education, and then the education of the various training schools that I went to, it put me in a good situation. Uh, and uh, so uh, education was very, very fortunate. But then you got to make decisions as you go through your career. Should I do this or should I do that? And so my career, I, you know, I took a step, a step to flight training. I did not have to volunteer for MIT. But I said, maybe that would be a good step to further my career. At the time, there was no idea that I was going to be an astronaut or even a flight. Uh, so it was a step here, a step here, a step there, as I changed sort of focus and direction. So it was a combination of a good education and making the right decisions. You're going to have to make a lot of decisions in your career. So uh, uh, think hard about what you're going to do. Okay? Thank you, sir. Yeah. I'd just like to start by thanking you for the fantastic talk tonight, Daryl, too. Uh, my name is Sean Keogh. I'm a, a sophomore in uh, interactive media. And I'd like to ask you, uh, if you could return to the mood and leave a different object there, uh, what would you leave? Well, I, uh, I left a couple of things on the moon. The picture of my family was very important to me because uh, our kids were, uh, one had just turned seven and the other was almost five. And I was gone all the time in training. We lived in Houston, but none of the training was in Houston. It was all scattered around the country, mostly in the morning. And so I wanted to get incorporate these kids into this, into this mission, if you will. And I said, would you guys like to go to the moon with me? Yeah, man. And so I said, well, let's do it in a photograph. And so that was very special. And then it was uh, 1972 was the 25th anniversary of the Air Force. So I wrote the chief of staff a little letter and said, I'm going to be the only Air Force officer up on the moon in 1972. I'd like to say happy birthday. Would you like to participate? Man, that's a great idea. So they sent me these two little coins, uh, medals, uh, that commemorated the 25th anniversary of the Air Force. And, he, and uh, so he said, take them both. If you can take them both, do that. Leave one on the moon and bring the other one back, which I did. And that coin is on display, or was, at the Air Force Museum in, in Dayton, Ohio. So those are the things I got to take. I got each. Each astronaut had a, uh, what was called a personal preference kit. So I took some jewelry, little pieces of jewelry for my mom and my wife and mother-in-law and sister, and, you know, all of those little things like that. And uh, so we basically, uh, we were uh, pretty good shape about things that we could take. And they were pretty, uh, uh, pretty lenient. You couldn't smuggle anything on board. You didn't want to do that. I, I can't think of anything that I would have uh, changed uh, from what I had. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ryan. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to hear you talk and hear about your experiences. Uh, I just want to ask, how do you think you'd go about becoming an astronaut today? 
But some were pilots and they had a military background. Uh, so uh, if, if, you, if you're not in the military and you're not a pilot, you're going to need at least a PhD with a lot of experience in your field. And I don't think it matters too much uh, in engineering and math or engineering and science or medicine. They're selecting medical doctors. You know, a trip to Mars, you're going to need some medical help, perhaps. And uh, so all of that, uh, in, in just a wide scope, it, at least PhD and some research experience. If you're a military pilot, uh, test pilot school, and probably a master's degree is really required, like our group did. Okay, one more question, and then we need to flip. Uh, hello, my name is Daniel Eichler. I'm a junior at E student. And I was wondering, what, when you were in space, either in orbit, in transit, or actually on the moon, did you ever eat any of the astronaut ice cream? <laughs> uh, Apollo had no, had no ice cream. That was later on. Uh, we had the dehydrated stuff. Uh, but we did have uh, some peanut butter and jelly, and uh, we made a peanut butter sandwich. We had some regular food, but mostly was dehydrated. Have you ever tried it? Uh, the ice cream, uh, I didn't like it. Yeah, I tried it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the space shuttle, I mean, the space station has a refrigerator or a freezer and oven, a microwave and all that, but all we had was hot water and cold water. And on the moon, we had only cold water, so every, every meal, which was only two a day, breakfast, morning and evening, you, you ate everything cold. But you were so excited you didn't get very hungry. <laughs> so, thanks a lot for being here. Okay.